Good morning! So, today I want to talk about one of the most serious diseases of the 20th and the 21st centuries. I want to think about HIV. It's decimated the gay community, particularly in the 80s and 90s. It continues to decimate many parts of the sub-Saharan Africa and the developing world. It's a serious viral infection. And yesterday there was a report from America that a young child had been cured of HIV. Does that mean that the threat of this virus is over? Does that mean we can all relax? Well, I'm going to show you in this video that the answer to that is no. We're going to think about how the virus works. We're going to think about the chemistry of that and the chemistry of how the cures work. And by understanding that, we're going to see that HIV continues to be a threat that we need to be aware of and we need to take action against. If we start by thinking about the child who was apparently cured of HIV infection, there wasn't a new wonder drug in this case, it wasn't a new uh, treatment that had never been done before. What was done was the traditional drugs that are currently used in therapy of HIV patients were used very early when the child had just been born. They were delivered at high dose intravenously and it appears that two years later the viral load has dropped to sub-detectable levels. Now that's very interesting in itself but it doesn't indicate there's a new cure that will be available for people who are HIV infected and have been for some considerable period of time. Although it may be a new way of treating babies that are born with HIV to keep their viral loads extremely low. So how do cures for HIV work? What were these drugs that the baby was given and why do they act against the HIV virus? Viruses are beautifully simple organisms, for want of a better word. They consist of genetic material inside a protein shell. And the information in the genetic material codes for the protein shell. It contains everything necessary for the virus to create itself. The problem is, viruses can't reproduce without your cells, without a host cell. They hijack the machinery of a human cell in order to reproduce their genetic material. So what happens with the HIV virus is it contains RNA, that's a single-stranded version of DNA. Now, as you know, that contains bases which code for the information of life. That's carried into your cell by a protein coat. And then it hijacks the machinery of your cell to translate the information into new copies of the virus. So, a key step for the HIV virus is the translation of the RNA inside it into double-stranded DNA. It's called reverse transcription. And there's a protein in the coat of the virus that helps it to do that. And the way it works is it goes into your cell where there's plenty of the bases that code with the information of life. G, C, A and T, the four genetic letters. Now, what happens is the virus recruits those DNA bases and with reverse transcriptase, it builds a copy of its own RNA. How can chemists go about stopping that from happening? Well, one of the ways you could imagine it is to make a drug that looks a bit like one of your nucleobases. Let's have a look at the most famous HIV drug, AZT. First of all, let's look at thymidine. This is your naturally occurring DNA base. Now let's look at AZT, the drug. Spot the difference? The virus can't. The virus thinks that AZT is exactly the same as thymidine. Look more closely. On thymidine, there's an OH group in a key position. This allows the base to be built into the chain of DNA and to make a double-stranded copy of the viral RNA. Now look at AZT. In the same position, it doesn't have an OH, an alcohol group, it has an N3 group, an azide, hence the name, azidothymidine. That azide cannot be built into a chain. It stops the DNA base from being built into a chain. So what happens? The virus goes into your cell, it can't tell the difference between AZT and thymidine, so it grabs AZT by mistake. And that stops it from building a DNA copy of its own viral RNA. You inhibit 
reverse transcriptase, you prevent the virus from replicating. So AZT has a very simple mode of action based on the fact it looks and behaves like a DNA base but with one chemical change that stops it from being incorporated into DNA. And that is how basic drugs were developed to treat HIV. When they did the clinical trial of AZT in patients with HIV, the difference between AZT and the placebo was so dramatic that the trial was stopped early and all the patients were given AZT because it was saving lives, it was stopping patients dying. Now it might seem remarkable that they developed AZT so quickly. Well the reason is people had known for a long time that if you wanted to stop a tumour, one of the ways to do it was to stop rapidly dividing cells, to stop nucleic acids from reproducing themselves. So AZT had been tested as an anti-cancer drug and it wasn't suitable for use as an anti-cancer drug. It wasn't sufficiently active. But they had it in a library of compounds and when HIV came along they knew that stopping a virus was all about stopping the replication of genetic material. And anti-cancer drugs might stand a chance of doing that. That caused other problems because people felt that AZT had not been used as a cancer drug because it was too dangerous. And there were campaigns when AZT was being used in the gay community. People said it's a toxic drug, it's a killer drug, it's a cancer drug, it's going to give us cancers, it's not safe for use, it's not fit for use. I met a guy in a gay bar in San Francisco. He was absolutely convinced that it was a conspiracy theory and that HIV had been created by the government and that they had these pills waiting to treat it but they wanted to let it kill off part of the gay population. I mean, of course, it can't be true, but I can understand why he thinks like that. You know, this was a guy, he was in his 70s, 80s, he'd seen so many of his friends die of HIV. He'd seen the community that he was a part of decimated. And you look around for answers and you grab at whatever answers you think you might be able to find. So AZT was introduced, but on its own, there's a problem with AZT. Viruses can mutate. And the HIV virus can mutate more than almost any other. It does hardly any checking for errors. So it makes quite a lot of mistakes. So it has quite a high rate of mutation. And of course the genetic code that it's making is what makes the protein shell of the virus. And so if you make mistakes in the genetic code, you make mistakes in the protein shell. Now most of those errors in the protein shell just cause the virus to die. And if that's the case, it's not a problem. But some of the errors in the protein shell modify the protein shell. And for example, one of those proteins is reverse transcriptase. And so some of the mutations allow the reverse transcriptase to deal with AZT to cope with it, to avoid it, to ignore it. And that tiny amount of virus with that mutation will be the one that lives because everything else will be killed by the AZT. And so you can multiply up in the population a resistance to a specific drug. So how do you get around this? Well, you introduce triple therapy. So you don't just use one of these base mimics, you use two base mimics that look different to one another and behave slightly differently. And drugs like tenofovir are now used more commonly than AZT in combination with other base mimics, but they all work the same. They have something that looks like a DNA base attached to something that looks like a sugar, but can't be built into the DNA double helix. And you then take a third drug that attacks a different point of the viral life cycle, not reverse transcription. And by having two drugs that go for reverse transcription in different ways and one drug attacking a different part of the life cycle, you can keep the viral load properly under control and limit the ability of that virus to develop resistance to any one drug. You look at the decline in death rate after the introduction of triple therapy with all three drugs being used together and it's remarkable. AZT was a transformative drug. So does all that mean that we don't have to worry about HIV anymore and we can change our practices and behave in a different way? Well, the answer is no. Today, many people don't know their HIV infection state. They don't know whether they're positive or negative. They haven't been tested. You might think 
it doesn't matter if you catch HIV because there's drugs that can cope with it. And AZT was transformative and triple therapy does allow you to keep on top of your viral load currently. But the HIV virus is mutating all the time in response to the drugs it's being treated with. Who's to say that the HIV virus in 20 years time will remain as easily treatable as it is today? Safe sex remains of vital importance for gay men. It's not only gay men who have to worry about these things. Increasing levels of HIV infection in the heterosexual community have been happening for a number of years now. What can you do? The best line of defence is still protection. Condoms are still essential in the fight against HIV AIDS. Drugs, they're going to help people. They're stopping the disease currently from being a death sentence. But still, you'd be foolish to want to get the virus, given how dangerous it is and the way in which it can mutate so easily.